Okay, here we go. Let's read, how about Philippians chapter 2? And let's read verses 1 through 11. Here we go. Paul says, Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Do you know, not for only years, not for only decades, but for my entire life, Jesus is truly the only one that has ever encouraged me. No wife has encouraged me. No best friend that I can remember until I was a much older man ever gave encouragement. Is there any comfort from the Lord's love? We start getting that comfort from the Lord as we spend one-on-one -on -one time with Him. I remember one night I was under incredible demonic attack and I was laying on my couch being tortured, practically in tears. And I said, Lord, where is the love? Where, where is the peace? Where, where are any of these things that we read about in the Bible? When does anything ever happen? And he told me in a loving voice, you see, he was standing over to the right of my couch. He was invisible but he, quite often when he appears to you, he'll let you know he's there, even though he's invisible. And Jesus said to me, Garrett, you only get these things by abiding in me. Is there any fellowship together in the Spirit? We're going to get these things by abiding in the Lord. Then Paul asks them a question. Are your hearts tender and compassionate? I have never, never, have ever seen a Christian man or woman whose hearts were tender and compassionate. Have I seen a man or woman who had a, a little bit of a tender heart and some compassion? Yes, I have. But we're talking about a deep level of tenderness here, a deep level of compassion. I, I've never seen a Christian anywhere in the world who had a deep level of tenderness and compassion. And that right there is one of the reasons, just one, it's one of the reasons why we're going through the whole seven-year tribulation and that the pre-tribulation rapture is a lie. We're going through it. Verse 2, Paul says, Then make me truly happy, by agreeing wholeheartedly. The key word there is wholeheartedly. Agreeing with all of your heart with each other. Do the churches do that? No. That's why we have something like 40,000 different denominations. Because the churches are not wholeheartedly agreeing with each other. Why? because they're not tender and compassionate. Paul says, make me happy. Agree with all your heart and soul with each other, loving one another. Do Christians do that? Sometimes. Paul continues, and working together. Working together? I don't see really anybody doing that. What we see are 40,000 separate denominations 
with most people doing their own thing, including myself. I've got my own YouTube channels and everything else on the internet. I don't see us working together. I see us working separately in pride, arrogance, self-righteousness, pharisaical attitudes, and better than thou thoughts and philosophies. My church is better than yours. We are the ones that are right. Everyone else is wrong. Paul goes on to say, agreeing wholeheartedly, working together with one mind and purpose. What church does that? Well, you'll be, you'll be saying, well, Garrett, my church does. Well, right there, that's your pride and arrogance. I mean, couldn't we just be honest? We got 40,000 different denominations. If somebody just sneezes and coughs in church, they start a different denomination. One denomination wants to worship on one day. Another denomination wants to worship on a different day. A different denomination pushes this gift. Other denominations push the other gifts. Some denominations push um, a, a rapture theology. Some push something else. Oh, 40,000 different denominations. Nobody, just about nobody is doing uh, verse number one and two. Let's go to verse three. Paul says, don't be selfish. Every Christian is selfish. Everybody. You might be thinking, well, Garrett, you don't know my pastor. You should just see him. That right there is pride, arrogance, and idolatry. You're worshiping your pastor. Some of you might be thinking, well, you ought to see my mom. My, my mom isn't selfish at all. She gives her whole life. Well, it's because you can't see the fleshly nature inside of her. The entire worldwide church is selfish. Let's confess our sins to God and confess our sins to one another so that we might be healed. Paul says, don't try to impress others. <laughs> I, I won't even go there. Let's continue. Paul says, be humble. In my life, can I think of one person, just one? I'm not going to try to name ten. I'm not going to try to name five. I, I'm, I, I'm, right now, I'm being honest before God the Father and His Son Jesus. Can I name one person who seriously takes being humble? One person. Not really. I maybe one, maybe not, in my whole life, in my entire life, maybe one, maybe nobody at all. Paul says, think of others as better than yourselves. If we were doing that, we would not have 40,000 denominations. If we were doing that, our entire lives would be different. How many of us are actually walking out a life day to day, hour to hour, thinking of others as better than ourselves? I do know of one person who tries to practice that, but e even he can't. I, I, I don't know anybody who's walking this out. I've never seen anybody. I, I, I know of one man who practices a little bit, but I, I really don't know anybody who's walking out verse 3. Verse 4, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Can I name one person who walks that out every day? 
Maybe, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Maybe one or two. Let's go to verse 5 now. We're gonna, Paul's going to change the topic here a little bit. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. That's a commandment right there. Paul says, though he was God, did you know the Bible calls Jesus God? The Bible calls the Son of God, God, in multiple locations. Paul then says, Jesus did not think of equality with God. You see, there's two of them. Paul just told us. There's not one of them. There's not three of them. There's two of them. Jesus did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. You see, the Lord was perfect walking as a human being. And trying to walk in his equality with God would have been a form of pride and ego and abuse of power and and on and on. And the Lord didn't do that. What did he do? Verse 7, Paul tells us, instead of doing all that prideful stuff, he gave up his divine privileges. He gave them up in a form of submission to his father. Have I seen anybody do this? No. Have I seen anybody do the up up above? No. Anybody do the beginning? No. Nobody. Not one person. And you actually think you're going to escape in a pre-tribulation rapture which cannot be found anywhere in the Bible? No, child of God. You and I are not going anywhere except through the seven-year tribulation which we need to go through. We got to go through it. We have to go through it because we're not doing any of the above. Not any of it. Verse 7, Paul says, Instead, Jesus gave up his divine privileges and took the humble position of a slave. That's what we're commanded to do. You are not a mighty preacher. You are not a powerful prophetess, young lady. You are not an amazing teacher. We need to view others as better than ourselves and take up a position of a slave. How do we do that? In our hearts, with God's grace. Paul tells us Jesus was born, um, he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. You might be thinking, that's no big deal. So what? Everyone's born as a human being. You don't understand something. God's Son is also a creator class spirit much larger than our universe. And he went into a baby to be born. Paul tells us when Jesus appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God. That's what we want to be working on day and night, day and night. And Jesus died a criminal's death on the cross. Why did he do that? Because that was their plan. The Father and the Son, Jesus, planned for this to happen long ago, and they decided this would happen. Verse 9, therefore, God elevated him. Well, what do you mean elevated him? There's two of them. There's not one and there's not three of them. There's two of them. Therefore, God elevated his son Jesus to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. 
that is incredible glory and honor there that God the Father is giving to his son Jesus. In verse 10, Paul tells us that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue is going to declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God is still getting glory from his son Jesus. What an amazing love story the last part of this is from a father or God to his son Jesus who is also a God. The Son can also create life. The Son, we call him Jesus in the English language, even though he has thousands of names. He is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present. He can do anything. He can create. All right. Praise God. Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 11.